This leads us very naturally to the next fundamental element, balance. In this vertical texture, how are we to make sense of things? Which instrument supports and which leads? Without balance, we've got no way of expressing this, or indeed of expressing anything with all these instruments blasting away at exactly the same volume. So it's all about bringing clarity to your orchestral sound picture. The listener must be able to hear everything that is going on proportionally. And by using the word listener, I'm including the most important listeners of all, those who are performing your work. They're all seated in proximity to one another, carefully processing what they hear around them, and contributing their parts accordingly. A well-balanced work allows most players to hear each other with little confusion or interference. With a poorly balanced score, just the opposite is true. For the player, it's as if walls of sound have been erected around them, shutting them out from really understanding where they are, or why their part has meaning. This usually happens because the composer is thinking too much like a sound engineer. To them, every staff in a score represents a separate channel on a mixing board. All that's required of the player is to simply play their part at a given level, and if anything's wrong, we'll fix it in the mix. This approach would work great if everyone had a separate microphone, along with headphones, each with their own little mix to listen to. But this is what players are actually listening to. Here's a representation of how music is actually being played on the stage. I've cut up and reassembled a page of score, putting each staff into its relative position as orchestral seating. Right away, you can see how well this moment of music is scored, especially in this seating arrangement. The upper strings and higher winds can double each other with precision and unity. The lower strings, bass register winds, and horns can hit these downbeats as one stroke. That leaves the heavy brass with the melody and countermelody, projecting firmly from the center of the stage across all these patterns and punches. It's terrifically exciting to be in the orchestra at this point because everyone is fully engaged and working together with emphasis and focus. And that's because everything is perfectly clear, a landscape in which the separate vantage points all have clear sight lines from one to another. And that brings us to a specific aspect of balance that's so easily ignored, especially by a composer who's rarely heard a live orchestra performance or rehearsal. The stereophonic landscape. We hear binaurally. And what's more, each of our ears is structured so that we can hear direction and sound up or down, ahead or behind, far or near. This makes music a three-dimensional experience, especially for a listener sitting in the sweet spot of a concert hall with great acoustics. As much as the players can clearly hear and interact musically, the audience member will be able to appreciate the music. That's another point worth repeating, something to take home and hang on the fridge, where if you're like me, you'll see it constantly. <laughs> As much as the players can clearly hear and interact musically, the audience member will be able to appreciate the music. What's more, the audience member has the advantage of standing outside the music and hearing all that is going on at once. A keen orchestrator will ensure that this experience has its own sense of space and volume. Now, it's important to point something out about balance. It's not simply a discussion of which instrument is louder and which is quieter. It's about contrasts of color of pitch, of distance, and of meaning. Don't think dynamics. Think dynamism. All the functions of your orchestral score that allow it to be set into meaningful motion will find their source and in initiation in the concept of balance. That said, a deep understanding of dynamic relationships is essential for the working orchestrator. And along with this should be a perception of not just the relative volume of instruments, but also their ability to project. Some instruments can sound quite convincing when you're sitting next to them, but may not have the fullness of tone to reach the back of the auditorium with any coherence. That's an instance that shows how orchestration is really based upon instrumentation. You have to know all the strengths and quirks of each instrument and section, both individually and in comparison to one another. You have to be aware of the traditional alliances and rivalries in order to capitalize on them, or subvert them, or to ultimately get past them in creating your own personal style.
Two experiences shaped my own perception of the way dynamics work orchestrally. The first comes from my teenage years, reading some advice from Rimsky-Korsakov, who warned that a solo entrance should never be marked mezzo-forte or mezzo-piano, otherwise it would sound lifeless. That puzzled me as a young composer, because the statement wasn't exactly justified by an explanation. But it was just intriguing enough to store away for further contemplation. Now fast forward to my thirties, as a resident composer for a group of young virtuoso string players. I was explaining how my piece used mezzo piano and mezzo forte, with a further discussion of the subtleties, when one of the players cut through all my nonsense with the simple question, is there such a thing as just an M? Of course, this makes perfect sense if you think of dynamics as a thermometer, with fixed, scientifically measurable values. If mezzo piano and mezzo forte are neighbors on a linear scale, then certainly there should be a point at the middle that's simply mezzo, shouldn't there? Such lines of thought show how far we've gotten away from the simplicity of the original terms of forte and piano. Forte doesn't only mean loud in Italian. It also carries the additional connotation of force, or strength. Likewise, piano isn't simply defined as soft, but also as restrained. The difference is that loud and soft are positions on a dial, to be turned up and down at the whim of the listener or sound technician. But for a musician, especially one who uses breath, or the strength of their arm, it's all about applying force or restraint. A passage or phrase or even a single note begins at one dynamic and changes to another. That is a dynamic moment. In fact, the process of bowing is in itself dynamic, with the bow gaining or losing strength depending on direction and distance of the frog to the strings. In this case, maintaining a perfectly even, unchanging tone requires a type of playing that's essentially unnatural to the ergonomics of a bow stroke. Therefore, I propose that we bin the entire notion of the dynamic thermometer and exchange it for a Venn diagram. On this side is the quality of force, on the other, restraint. Where they interact in the middle is where mezzo piano and mezzo forte occur, with the important caveat that these are states that are highly directional. Dynamics go somewhere and accomplish things along the way. That is their purpose, not simply to make things louder or softer. They can't be static entities, otherwise you may as well just work with sound sets and synthesizers, instead of living, breathing musicians who need to do something. On top of that, there's a further important and much overlooked fact. Orchestral instruments are designed to sound the most characteristic and compelling when they commit to one side or the other of this diagram. That is the justification to Rimsky-Korsakov's warning about keeping solo entrances away from this middle region. If an instrument emphatically commits to either using force or restraint, then its true nature will be easily and beautifully in evidence. In forte, you'll hear all those things that distinguish an instrument being pushed, its timbre, its attack, and its arc of phrasing and expression. In piano, the subtleties will emerge as the force is relaxed, discrete contrasts of shading, a variety of initiation of tone, and the sense of an open space that's got one small focused color in its midst. Here in the middle, though, you rob orchestral solo instruments, and even a lot of regular passages, of their impact and individuality. That's because, as much as they've been designed to draw attention when applying force or restraint, they've also been designed to stay out of the way in a larger texture when they're scored mezzo-anything. Contrasts of tone are every bit as important as dynamics in balancing a score. Once again, here's a topic that could have a whole book written about it. An orchestrator may need to balance the quality of a sound as much as its quantity. Here's where one would decide whether to double or not to double, or in which register or section a motive should be placed. This topic has a direct relationship to its sister across the face of the clock. Timbral individualization. In balancing a score, 
a composer will often distill a specific type of sound to impart meaning to a phrase, or create separation between ideas. This can involve a combination of instruments that embody a distinct sound, or a subsection of instruments that's spotlighted as a chorus in contrast to the rest of the orchestra. This is one of the main benefits I can see in having an enormous ensemble on the scale of the planets, with its quadruple winds and so on. You can have choruses within choruses within choruses, groups of instrument whose timbres can be combined in countless ways, individualized, or set in opposition to one another. Compared to this inexhaustible resource of innovation, all those huge sweeping tutti chords seem rather simple and brutal. Ultimately, though, all these factors, clarity, dimension, and contrasts of force and tone, they all must underline the bottom line of comprehensibility. It's not enough to define a texture clearly. The balance of a score must also convey meaning along with its clarity. And that naturally leads us directly to the third basic element, function. But as we move on, notice that while we've really broken down and analyzed many of the aspects of balance, there's no possible way we can bridge between texture and function without it. Mm -hmm. 